I just feel in my spirit that this morning some of you guys are discovering this this super weapon of praise in your life and I just believe that today there's a day for for deliverance if you've been struggling with anxiety maybe depression or if you know somebody that struggles with that today I believe that that there's going to be deliverance so come on let's just begin to set our eyes on Jesus as we praise he roars as we praise the lion of the tribe of Judah roars over depression over anxiety he brings the power of of any struggle of depression and anxiety so come on if you need him this morning just begin to praise him just begin to reach out to him not just if you need him but if you love him if you want him if you want his spirit poured out all over this place come on let's just begin to cry out oh we cry out oh 
on, just lift up your voice in adoration onto Jesus. Come on, come on, Radiant Church, you have permission to get loud.
Come on, don't let out, don't let out. This for him, this for him. Oh, guys, when Jesus. Jesus. We don't get tired of praising you. We don't get tired of saying who you are. You are the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings.
this moment. The Holy Spirit is in this room right now. Just worship the Lamb. Just worship Jesus. Come on, just reach out to Him right now. Oh, bless you. In honor. Dominion is yours. Lift him up, let's lift him up. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I know we went a little bit long in worship, but isn't the presence of God so worth it? Amen. 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 
Amen. Hallelujah. If you could, do guys, do me a favor, say hello to the person next to you, and then you guys may be seated. God bless you. Lord, we thank you for your presence here today. Mm, thank you, Lord. Well, this morning, before we go any further, we have the honor and the privilege of participating in the baby dedication for Evelyn Michelle Erker. Her mom and dad, Grace and Anthony, are here today to dedicate her to the Lord. At Radiant Church, we do not practice infant baptism because the scripture makes it clear that you have to be old enough to understand and make a commitment to follow Jesus before you're baptized in water. But we do practice baby dedication. And that's where mom and dad come together to say, Lord, we understand this child is a gift from God. Every life is a precious gift from God, amen? So we celebrate life in this house. And so we're gonna celebrate the life of Evelyn Michelle and I'm gonna ask you all to stretch out your hands. Pastor Rashad and Crystal are here because precious little Evelyn is, um, they are part of our Embrace Grace ministry. Yes. So I want you to stretch out your hands and your, your faith towards Evelyn as we pray for her this morning. Lord, we thank you for Evelyn. You formed her, you shaped her in her mother's womb before she was born. You called her by name and you have a divine destiny and a holy purpose for Evelyn's life. And so today as the body of Christ, we come together in one accord, asking you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to send forth your angels all around Evelyn all the days of her life. Send angels to go before her, angels behind her, angels all around her and we pray that Evelyn would come to know you from a very young age that she would be one of your sheep that she would hear your voice and follow you Lord we ask you to fulfill your will and your purpose your divine destiny in her life in Jesus name and for your glory we dedicate her to you Lord and now we give her back to mom and dad and we pray over Grace and over Anthony. So stretch forth your hand, your hands to this couple, this family today. Lord, we come to you today and we pray for Anthony and for Grace that they would raise up Evelyn and all the children that you bless them with, that they will raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would minister to Anthony and Grace that you would bring healing to their hearts and their lives, that Jesus Christ would be the center of their hearts, their home, their family. We pray, Lord, that you would, you would pour out your spirit and your holy, awesome fire upon Anthony to be the priest of his home, to be a man of God who follows after you with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength, who leads his family well. And we pray, Lord, for grace, that your fire would consume her heart and her soul, that she would have a burning heart for Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, that their family would bring glory and honor and blessing and power and praise to the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, bless them and bless them indeed. Bless their family. May they follow hard after you all the days of their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And if you have a child or children that you would like to dedicate to the Lord, just let us know. You can contact us at Connect 
at radiantchurch.org. And uh, we would love to participate in dedicating all of our children to the Lord. Amen? All right, let's give Kim a big round of applause as she comes. I just love those. Baby dedications are my favorite. Anybody else? They're fun. They're sweet. Well, good morning, Radiant Church. My name is Kim. I'm the lead assistant here at Radiant. We are so honored that you're here with us this morning. If this is your first, second, or third time visiting Radiant, would you just raise your hand? We won't shine a spotlight on you or anything. We just want to know who you are and give you a great big hand. Oh, we're so honored that you're here. Thank you for coming. I know at the end of the service, um, Pastor Kelly would love to say hi to you. Just visit our uh, Meet the Pastor table there out in the foyer. If you wouldn't mind, if you are visiting for the first, second, or third time, would you fill out one of these uh, connection cards in the seat pocket in front of you? It's just um, to help us get to know you a little bit better, to help you get plugged in if you'd like, if you're ready for that, and to pray for you. Each and every week at our staff meetings, we hold these cards in our hands and we pray for every request on them. So be sure and fill it out if there's anything at all that you'd like for us to know. Um, again, thank you for coming today. Now, if you've been coming for a little while now and you're interested in getting to know the heart of Radiant Church and the hearts of our lead pastors, Todd and Kelly Hudnall, we would invite you to take the Ascent classes. It's a set of four online classes that you can view from your own home. Um, just email us at connect at radiantchurch.org or you can visit our welcome desk before you leave today to get more information on viewing those classes. Once you're finished, you can email Jenny Dunn also at connect at radiantchurch.org to let her know that you're finished. She'll answer any questions that you have and set up a meeting with you to get you going on your next steps here at Radiant. A few exciting announcements. Number one, who um, is really good at Christmas decorating and you're, you're getting in the mood and you're getting, oh my goodness. We've got way more hands in this service than we did in the last one. That's exciting. Well, good news. We have a place for you to exercise those wonderful decorating gifts starting um, the Monday after Thanksgiving on November 27th at 9 a.m. We'll meet right out here in the foyer and you will have an opportunity to use those giftings and help us make this place beautiful and Christmassy. It's gonna be wonderful. We'll put the tree up. We'll have just a wonderful time of laughter and fun. So come and join us. But if you are planning to come, uh, be sure to email me at k a l z a m o r a at radiantchurch.org and just let me know that you're coming. This is going to be fun. Um, last announcement before we move ahead. Who also enjoys coming to our Roar services every Tuesday night? Yes. This is um, a dire time in our nation, amen, a dire time. And we have got to come together as a body to pray with one another. So we are inviting you to come on Tuesday, but there's a slight change. Instead of having it at 5.30 like we normally would, We've actually shifted it up to five o'clock. Now, if you can't quite make it by five, don't worry. We are going to extend it to an hour and a half. So it'll be from five to 6.30. So just come as soon as you can get here. Stay as late as you want. We're gonna have a time of worship and prayer and go before the throne room and see God move. Amen. We'll see you this Tuesday. All right, um, we are going to press pause on this part of the announcements. We will receive the offering at the end of the service today, so hang on to that. For now, let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this time that we can gather together in your name as your people. We love you. We give you praise, God, and we give you honor today. We pray that you would touch Pastor Kelly as she brings the word this morning. We pray that you would touch her body, give her strength, give her a sharpness of mind, um, prepare her for this word that you've given her today. We love you. We honor you, God, and we ask that you'd also prepare and soften our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I've asked them to forego the roll-in today. It's a really cool roll-in, I know. So let me end with how Pastor Todd ends the roll-in. We need the fire! Woo! We need the fire of God, amen? Well, since we went longer in worship, I just condensed the roll in for you. <laughs> we are in a series called Fire on the Altar.
Because uh, back in the summertime, Pastor Todd and I were praying and, and seeking the Lord, and the Lord took us back to Revelation chapter 2. In the book of Revelation, where Jesus goes to the church in Ephesus, he goes to the seven churches. But when he goes to the church in Ephesus, first he commends them for all of the great things that they're doing, all of the things that they're doing well. But then he says, but I have one thing against you. He said, you've lost your first love. You've lost your fire and your passion for the Holy One. You've lost that, that loving feeling. If you were here when Pastor Todd sang, tried to sing like the Righteous Brothers, you'll never forget. And you'll, you'll never look at that song the same way ever again, right? But we do not ever want to lose our passion and the fire of God in our hearts, in our lives, in our homes, and in our church. Because if you lack the fire of God, then all you have left is cold, dead religion. And cold, dead religion will not get you through the days that we're living in right now. We are living in the last of the last days. If you go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, read it, and you'll say, oh my goodness, this sounds like what we are living through now. If you go to Matthew 24, read the words of Jesus, where he explains the signs of the times and what things will be like in the last days. And you will say, oh my goodness, we are living there now. And I want to read to you Matthew 24. These are the words of Jesus. He started out in verse 4 by saying, don't be deceived. So I want you to turn to somebody, those of you online, those of you here present, turn to somebody right now and tell them, don't be deceived. Those are the words of Jesus to the disciples then and to us now in this day. And he then goes on to say in verse 10, and then, now let's stop and talk about then. What is the then Jesus was talking about? He's talking about the last of the last days just before the Antichrist appears on the scene. He said, then in that day, the day we're living in now, many will be offended. Have you ever seen a time where people were more offended than they are now? I mean, it is insanity. Oh my goodness. And, and, and I, I want to say, this. I think this needs to stop in the church. It's one thing for the world to get offended over everything, but my goodness, sons and daughters of God, stop getting offended. You're taking the bait of Satan. It's a trap. But Jesus said in the last days, many were going to be offended. And the, he goes on to say, and repelled, and they will begin to distrust and desert him whom they ought to trust and obey. Now, how many of you know people today that say they are deconstructing their faith? How many of you heard that, that phrase in recent days? A few of you have. I've heard it many times. We have watched Christian artists and Christian leaders and, and Christians who, who were at one time following the Lord, but they lost the fire of God or they never had the fire of God. And all they had was cold, dead religion. They went through the motions, but they didn't have a living, breathing, Holy Spirit, fire-filled, passionate relationship with Jesus Christ. And they lost, they lost that passion, they lost that fire, and they fell away. Jesus said in the last days that many will stumble and fall away. And we are seeing that today. My heart is broken every week as I hear about another person who at one time was following Jesus and now they've completely turned away. Jesus said that they will betray one another and they will pursue one another with hatred. Friends, we're living in that day. And therefore, we must be, as Jesus said, he said, behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. We must be wise in the day that we're living in. And it is foolish to not pay attention and be very intentional about kindling the fire of God on the altar of our hearts, our homes, and our church. Come on, can I get a witness here today? 
We must return to the things we did at the first, which is what Jesus tells the church in Ephesus in Revelation 2. And the words to the church in Ephesus are still his words to the church today. He said, return to the things you did at the first. And so that's what we've been doing since September. And we're wrapping it up with these last few final messages because we believe the Lord has said it's important you go back to the first things so that you fuel the fire and you kindle the fire that burns on the altar of your hearts and in the church and in your homes. So recently we've been talking about the important habits of a follower of Jesus that fuels that fire. We've talked about worship and how worship fuels that fire of God in our souls. We talked about serving. Last week, it was all about serving according to the way God has shaped you and how serving according to God's giftings and talents and abilities he's placed in us fuels that fire of God in us. We talked about prayer and communion, fellowship with him. It fuels the fire of God in our hearts, in our homes, and in our church. We've talked about community and how important it is that we come together as the body of Christ in one accord as they did on the day of Pentecost. We've talked about discipleship and lordship and all of these things are keys to fueling the fire of God that burns in our hearts and burns in our souls, that keeps our marriages strong, that keeps our families strong, that keeps our church strong, and it keeps us on the straight and narrow path that leads to life. Give God praise for his holy fire. And today we're gonna talk about another essential habit that is absolutely necessary to fuel the fire of God in our hearts, our homes, and in our church. And that is the habit of giving. We're going to talk about the importance of giving and generosity in the life of the disciples of Jesus Christ. Jesus had a lot to say about money and possessions. How many of you knew that? He had a lot to say about it. And why is that? Well, in Matthew 6, 21, Jesus said, where your treasure is, your money, your heart will be also. Therefore, God is extremely concerned and cares about where your heart is. And if you're where your money is, there your heart will be also. It's very important that we look to the word of God as always, everyone in the word, every day. We have to look at God's word to see how he has called us to handle our finances, our resources, amen? Amen. And what we see in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is teaching there about money and possessions. And I want you to hear what he says. He says, first of all, don't store up treasures here on earth where moth and rust destroys, where thieves can break in and steal. He said, but instead in verse 20, store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Listen, the enemy of your soul does not want you to look at your finances, your treasure, your resources, according to the Bible. Because the enemy of your soul wants to keep you from the abundant life that God came to give you. So in verse 31, Jesus goes on to say, don't worry about all these things, about what will we eat and what will we drink and what will we wear. Jesus said, these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly father already knows all of your needs. And then he ends with verse 33. He said, but seek first, say it with me, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these other things, they'll be added to you. You'll be taken care of. As long as you put him first, 
As long as you trust in the Lord with all your heart, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and lean not on your own wisdom, your own understanding, but in all your ways, as long as you acknowledge him and put him first, he will direct your paths and he will take care of you. And every one of you like me who has seen that God is faithful and true, give him praise that he is the promise giver and he is the promise keeper. He's faithful and true. So the Bible teaches us that everything we have belongs to God. If Jesus is Lord, I'm not. And if Jesus isn't Lord over all, he's not Lord at all. So as his sons and his daughters, we have no other option but to surrender fully to him and and allow him to be the Lord over every aspect of our lives. And I promise you this, until we come to that place, we will be miserable, disappointed, discouraged, defeated, depressed, because it's only when we realize and live as if Jesus truly is Lord that we experience the abundant life. (laughs) Praise you, Lord, for the abundant life. You know, I've heard so many people say, well, if Jesus came to give us the abundant life, then why aren't we living it? Well, that's why we're not, because we don't truly surrender all to Him. And that's what's so wonderful about tithing and giving. It teaches us to always put Him first. And so I am so excited to share with you today 10 benefits that God gives us from His Word, in His Word, from for those who are faithful to honor God with the tithe. But first, I remember hearing John Maxwell years and years ago, he shared a modern day version of the parable that Jesus gave in Matthew 25. And we've been talking about this, referring to it the last few weeks. But in Matthew 25, Jesus tells a parable. He tells a story about there are three guys, three servants, and their master entrusts talents to each of the three servants. And uh, to one, he gives one talent, to one he gives two, and to the other he gives five. And, And you remember two of the guys are faithful with the little they had received. They invest it, they steward it well, and they gain two more and they get, the other one gains five more. But then there was one who did nothing. He sat on the one talent he was given and he, not only did he not gain any more, but the one that he had been given was taken away from him. And, and this is so important for us today when we think about giving and we think about putting God first in every area of our lives. And let me stop right now and debunk any lie of the enemy. We do not teach tithing at Radiant Church because we want your money. Okay, we teach tithing at Radiant Church because it's the word of God. And we want you blessed. Listen, to be clear, you are not Jehovah Jireh. You are not our provider. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is the Lord, our provider. So we're not here twisting your arm to try to get you to give so that we can have have more money in the church budget. That is not our heart at all. The Lord is our witness. But we're here because we telling you this today because Pastor Todd and I have been faithful tithers and generous givers for over 35 years for me and over 40 years for Pastor Todd, over 45, almost 45 years for him. And we have seen the Lord do exactly what he promised he would do again and again and again and again. If he said it, he will do it. You do his part, then you can trust God to do his part. But I love how John Maxwell tells about this guy who was down and out. He lost his job. He lost his health. He lost all of his money. And he's crying out to God and he's going, oh God, if you will just heal my broken body, I'll use my body to serve you, Lord. And oh God, if you will just give me a job and God, just give me some money, I will tithe and I will give generously to advance your kingdom around the world. And oh God, if you would just give me some special talent or ability, I will use it in the body of Christ. I will use it to serve you all the rest of my days. And the Lord listened to the man and he answered 
And he gave him all of those things. He gave him a job and finances and he gave him his health and healed his body and, and he gave him talents and abilities and, and the Lord waited and he waited and he waited and the man did none of the things he said he would do. So the Lord took them all away. And then the man is back again, crying out to God, oh God, if you would just give me back my health, I'll use my body to serve you. If you'll give me a job and some money, I'll invest it in your kingdom. He goes on and on. The Lord listened. And this time the Lord responded to the man and said, oh, shut up. And I have to say, I mean, that's basically the parable in Matthew 25, just in modern day terms. But Jesus' parable was a little more harsh because Jesus said the master with the first two, he said to the first two, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful with a little. Now I know I can trust you with more. Enter into the joy of your master. But the one who did nothing, the one that, that the master waited and waited and waited and waited and he did nothing with it, he said, you wicked and lazy servant, depart from me. So if you think my version is harsh, Jesus, his version is a little more harsh. And why is that? Is Jesus mean because he does that? No, Jesus is loving. And God the Father, Abba, is a loving parent. A loving parent tells their kids the truth, even when their kids don't want to hear it, because a loving parent wants their kids to experience the abundant life. And the only way you experience the abundant life of blessing that God wants to pour out upon you is to follow the Lord in obedience and be faithful. You know, the person that says, well, I'll start tithing when God blesses me with more money. No, you won't. If you won't bless him with what you have now, he can't trust you with more. It's a test. You, you guys, I tell my kids all the time, guys, every day we are faced with multiple tests. And God wants you to pass the test so that he can bless you with more. He wants to bless you. So invest what you have now. Invest whatever time you have now. If you're squandering your time on video games and social media and YouTube scrolling or whatever, I don't know what, what, what people do. If, if, if you're wasting or squandering your time now, God can't trust you with with more, with greater things in his kingdom. If you're not using the gifts and the talents and the abilities that he's given you now, you failed the test. He can't trust you with more. If you're not investing your tithes and your offerings in the kingdom of God, doing as Jesus said, storing up for yourselves treasures in heaven, if you're not doing that now with the little that you have now, you failed the test and he can't entrust you with more. But here's the good news. His mercies are new every morning. And that's why he has me up here today. He's saying, Kelly, tell him, tell him, my mercies are new every morning. If they'll just repent and stop squandering the gifts, the talents, the abilities, the treasures, the resources, the time that I've given them, and they'll start investing them today, then they're gonna pass the test. And I'm going to be able to entrust them with more. Give God praise for his goodness and his mercy. Praise God that his mercies are new every morning. So we're going to go to the word of God and we're going to look at what God says about finances. And the first thing we're going to see, because you, you know what? It, I don't care what, what you think. I don't care what I think because who am I? I'm just a human being. He's God. And who am I to question the God of the universe? So it doesn't really matter what popular opinion is or what my, my natural mind and my human reasoning tells me. What matters is what does God say? So we go to his word and what we see in his word is, first of all, some Christians are rich. Christians can be rich. You can be Christian and, and, and have wealth. 
And if the Lord, if you're faithful with what he gives you, he can entrust you with more. And then if you're faithful with that, he can entrust you with more. Does the Lord give us money to hoard it unto ourselves? No, that's not being faithful. (laughs) And some Christians can be poor. You can be rich, you can be poor, but a biblical Christian cannot be stingy and greedy. If you are, you're not not a biblical Christian. You're a lukewarm Christian or a complacent Christian. You're a disobedient Christian if you're greedy and stingy. So today, God's going to set us free from greediness and materialism and stinginess. Aren't you glad? Thank you, Lord, for setting us free. So when, one way that we demonstrate, one thing that a biblical Christian is to always be is grateful, thankful, and generous. That's biblical If you're stingy and you're always complaining and griping because you don't have enough, that's that's and that's a contradiction. We we need to nurture a heart of gratitude, praise, thanksgiving, and generosity. And God's baseline standard of generosity is 10%. It's the tithe. It began with Abraham. Back in Genesis, when an enemy came in and took Lot and his family and several members of of Abraham's uh, family and and people and uh, their livestock and possessions, and Abraham went in to take back what the enemy had stolen. And he went in and God gave him the victory. So when he came back from that victory, he took of all the spoils and he gave 10% back to God. It says that he gave to a priest named Melchizedek, who was a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Abraham began in the scripture all the way back in the beginning, this principle of tithing to God as an act of honor, as an act of gratitude, and as an act of devotion to him. Isn't that good? And then throughout the Old Testament, Tithing was followed as part of the law. Now, when Jesus came, he didn't come. He, these are the words of Jesus. He said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. And grace always does more than what we ever asked or imagined. Isn't that right? He does exceedingly abundantly beyond all we could ever ask for or imagine. So he didn't say, oh, now in the New Testament, nobody needs to give. no. Jesus, under the new covenant, always gives more. It's no, we're no longer under the law of tithing, but now we are in the grace of giving because of Jesus Christ, giving praise once again. Now, God has promised many blessings and benefits to those who tithe. So we're gonna look at them quickly. I only have about 20 minutes to get through this. Number one, Tithing reminds us that God is the true owner and giver of all that we have. I love that. And guys, we need to be reminded because we are, we have this carnal nature and the flesh. And then we have the devil and the powers of darkness that are always trying to whisper these lies into our ears, telling us that, that we have a right to do what we want to do and, and trying to get us to turn away from God's way and go our own way. And why is that a thing? Because again, the enemy of our soul is always trying to lead us away from God's blessing instead of into God's blessing. And that's what grace is all about. Grace leads us into the middle of his will. Grace leads us into the middle of that fountain of the blessing of God. And tithing reminds us, every time we tithe, we are reminded that God is the true owner and giver of everything we have. When I get a paycheck, it's not my paycheck. I think of that scene in in Nemo with all the seagulls going, mine, 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 mine. You guys remember that that scene from Nemo? It was a while, while ago. But it reminds us, no, when I came to Jesus Christ, everything I am, everything I have became his. Deuteronomy 8.18 says, always remember it is the Lord who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Let's go on to number two. Another benefit of tithing is it pleases God because God's pleased by our obedience. Every time we obey him, 
not begrudgingly and, and out of religious compulsion, but out of grace. I'll tell you, I love giving to God. I love tithing. I love that yesterday that our congregation partnered with Redemption Squad and we gave away 200 turkeys and Thanksgiving dinners to people in our community. It, it's, it truly is more blessed to give than to receive. And you know, the most miserable people on the earth are those who don't give, but are always worried about what they're gonna get. Isn't that the truth? You wanna see somebody who's a sour, prune-faced, miserable wretch. It's somebody that's always worried about, what am I gonna get? What am I gonna get? And the most happy and blessed are those who are freely giving out of the grace of God as Jesus gives, amen? So God is pleased by your obedience. And in Malachi 3.10, God is speaking here. You should read the whole chapter, Malachi chapter three, especially verses eight through 10. God says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there is food in my house. And we're gonna read more of it in just a few moments. But God tells us, bring the 10th. His, he, God, calls his people to that baseline percentile giving of 10%. Leviticus 27, verse 32, I love this. This will change your perspective of the tithe. It says the entire tithe, every 10th, will be holy to the Lord. Now the word holy means to be separate. And so years and years ago, when I first came to Christ, I read that. And I'm telling you, it, it, it set my heart on fire to want to give. Because I realized the first 10% is holy to the Lord. That means it's separate unto God. That means as his follower, if Jesus is Lord of my life, I don't get to get my paycheck and go, let's see, do I really want to tithe this month or not? No, if I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, it's holy unto the Lord. It belongs to him. It's separate unto the Lord. And I remember when our daughter Faith was five years old, and you guys, many of you, most of you know Faith. She's 18 now. She loves the Lord with all her heart. Um, she's writing songs. She's a worship leader. She just passionately follows Jesus. But listen, parents, you need to start teaching your children the principles of tithing when they're young. And they need to see you following it and living it out. But I remember when Faith was five years old, I got her a giving bank. And it had three different sections or compartments. One was um, the church. One was a store in the middle. And then the other was a bank. And I sat her down, five years old, and I got a hundred pennies. And I laid out the hundred pennies and I talked to her about how the tithe is holy unto the Lord. And I said, Faith, the Lord asks us as an act of obedience and devotion and trust in him, he asks us to give him the first 10%. And I said, so 10% of 100 pennies would be 10 pennies. And I said, so you put, pull out 10 pennies. And she pulled, out, pulled them out, counted them one, two, three, all the way to 10. And then I talked to her about how the rest the Lord gives us to steward well as we serve him in his kingdom. And I said, to so the rest, 80% should go to the store and meeting our needs and taking care of our families and, and things like that. And I said, and then 10% you should save and set aside. Um, you know, for that, that's a, another financial uh, management teaching. We won't go there today. God bless you. But anyway, so she looks at these piles and she sees the 10 penny pile for God. And then she sees the 90 penny pile for her. And she kept looking at those piles and she looked at me with those big green eyes. Mom, are you sure? And I said, well, of course I'm sure. It's what the Bible says. She looks at the piles again and says, mom, are you really sure? And I said, yes, Faith, I'm really sure. And she was really struggling with this. And then she stopped in, in such precious sincerity. She said, Mom, God must really love me to only ask me to give him 10 pennies and he lets me keep all the rest. 
her little five-year-old heart was so touched by the love of God. And listen, he says, unless you come to me like a little child, you will not experience the joy of his kingdom and the fullness as he wants you to. So let's be like faith and, and see this isn't about God taking 10% from us. It's about God blessing us and providing for us. It's about my trust is not in man. My trust is not in my ability to take care of all my needs. My trust, every time I tithe, I'm saying my trust is in my Father, in my heavenly Father. Give him praise today. (laughs) Number three, God is honored by our faithfulness. He's honored when we're faithful to bring the whole tithe to him. You know, we go back to Abraham, when Abraham gave God 10% by giving it to Melchizedek. This was a response to God's faithfulness to him. It showed and demonstrated gratitude and praise. Proverbs 3, 9 says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your increase. So our giving is a part of our worship. Every time we give, we're not just throwing money in a plate. Every time we give, it's an expression of worship and trust. Number four, it keeps your priorities straight. Tithing keeps our priorities straight. Now, I love Deuteronomy 14, 23. This is a scripture I may have to add to one of the walls in our house. And my whole family, if they hear this, they'll be going, oh, more words. (laughs) Because I have scripture verses everywhere in every room. But I love this from the Living Bible. Deuteronomy 14, 23. The purpose of tithing is to teach you to always put God first in your life. Isn't that good? And and I'll say this again, if he's not Lord of all or over all, he's not truly Lord at all. So it teaches us again to always acknowledge he is Lord, I'm not, and to put him first. Number five, tithing makes you eligible for a blessing. And not tithing makes you ineligible for a blessing. And and let me explain. Um, But first I want to read to you God's words, God speaking here in Malachi 3, verses 8 to 11. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open there with me so you can highlight and write in the margin. But God is speaking here and he says, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, well, in what way have we robbed you, God? God answers and says, in tithes, and in offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Now, I've had people say, you mean God curses people when they don't tithe? No, but the God of this world, Satan, is a legalist, and he's always looking for those loopholes, those cracks, and those crevices that he can sneak in and steal God's blessing from God's people. And so every time we say no to the plan of God, no to the word of God, we are stepping out from under God's beautiful umbrella of protection. And we leave ourselves wide open for the God of this world, Satan, to attack us spiritually, physically, mentally, financially. And the minute I repent and say, oops, God, I messed up doing my own thing. I'm coming back to your way. Then we are under that umbrella of protection once again. No, God is the curse breaker and the blessing bringer. But if you want his blessings, you have to come under his umbrella. You can't step outside of his umbrella of protection and expect the blessing. The the enemy is going to go after you out there. So God in his love says, come back, repent. And he said, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there's food in my house and test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see, it's the only place in the whole Bible that I'm aware of where God says, put me to a scientific test. And it's with the tithe. He said, see, just put me to the test. Trust me enough to give me 10 pennies out of every dollar and see If I will not rebuke the devourer for your sake, throw open the windows of heaven and pour out so much blessing on you that it overflows you. Now, 
God wants to throw open the floodgates of heaven. He wants to protect you. He wants to bless you. He wants to rebuke the devourer for your sake. But you have to come into alignment with him and in obedience with him in order to see him be able to do that for you. Now, I have to tell you, some of you have heard this story before, but it is such an amazing testimony. It is like, we have so many tithing testimonies, but this is the mega testimony. Listen, none of us like tests, but you have to have a test in order to have a testimony. So Pastor Todd and I pastored a church in East Texas for 12 years. We saw a move of God, revival. The church grew from 250 to over 2,000 and uh, because God was moving and blessing. It was amazing. Just the miracles that were taking place. And so we were constantly in a building program. So instead of buying a home, we lived in the little parsonage next door to the church, and we just took money that would have been spent on a house payment, we put it in, into God's house to pay off his house. And so we would give our tithes, and then we'd give our, our money over and above the tithe into the building fund, and we would pray in faith and say, Lord, we cheerfully give this money to pay off your house, and we thank you in advance that someday you will provide us with a house, because we're not trusting in ourselves. We're not trusting in our own wisdom and in our own understanding. We're giving generously to God and trusting in the Lord with all our heart to be our provider. So we move to San Diego, California, where the housing market is unbelievable. And so we had so many people tell us, don't buy, just wait, it's the, the market's too high. But when we prayed, we felt the Lord said, go ahead and buy. So we had to go down to Chula Vista near the Tijuana border because that was the only place we could afford a house. So we bought a house that was about five and a half years old and moved in. It was our first home we owned together. And uh, we got everything set up and it was Thanksgiving day. We had a turkey in the oven, the table was set, company on their way, when all of a sudden, it sounds like we have a waterfall in our kitchen. Well, we didn't have a waterfall. We didn't have a water feature. I turned around to see water pouring out of one of the pot lights in the kitchen ceiling. So I did what most women would do. I yelled, Todd! He came running down the stairs as fast as he could to see the water coming out of the pot light. Now, long story short, what had happened, we discovered, was when the house had been built five and a half years previously, a piece of plumbing in the master bathroom had been installed incorrectly. So for five and a half years, it was leaking. It was leaking in, and nobody knew. Nobody knew what was happening. And that particular day, Thanksgiving Day, we had only been in the house four weeks. The plumbing decided to explode, give way, and water came through the pot light in the ceiling. So we, you know, it was a shock. And uh, we called our insurance company. We're at peace. Oh, we have homeowner's insurance. Everything's good. They send someone out to investigate. He goes up, cuts a hole in our kitchen ceiling, climbs up into the ceiling, comes back down and says, your house is full of mold and your insurance does not cover mold. So, then we call other people to get estimates, and all of the estimates were ranging, ranging between $60,000 and $80,000 in mold mitigation and repairs. Well, we didn't have that kind of money. And so we had to stand on the promises of God. And I will never forget one day, the Lord reminded me of Jesus when he cursed the fig tree and it shriveled up from the root and died. The Lord reminded me of that story. And then he reminded me of the words of Jesus in John 14, 12, when Jesus said, the same works I do, you will do also in even greater works. So in the name of Jesus, I stood up and I started cursing that mold. In the authority of the name of Jesus, I curse you mold and I command all mold to dry up, to disappear, leave our home in Jesus' name. And then we would go to the throne room of God. We would go to, to Abba's feet and we'd say, okay, Lord, we've done our part. We've been faithful tithers. And you said, if we do our part, we could put you to the test and you would do your part. So Lord, we thank you that you are rebuking the devourer for our sakes. We trust you, Lord, with all of our heart. 
Guys, this was our house, first home we'd ever purchased, moved into it. Four weeks later, we can't use our upstairs bathroom. Our master bathroom is off limits. So we move into our first home. We can't even use the master bathroom. And uh, for 10 months, for 10 months, we cursed that mold in the name of Jesus. For 10 months, we kept standing on the promises of God, saying, Lord, we know you're the promise giver and you're the promise keeper. You're faithful and true. After 10 months, it was October. By this time, I'm pregnant with faith. And uh, a man in our church, he and his family had just recently started coming to the church. He goes to one of our board members. He said, hey, it's Pastor Appreciation Month and I wanna do something for our pastors. Do you have any recommendations? He tells him about our situation 10 months earlier, and that was the kind of work he did. He said, why don't you go down and just check it out, see if there's anything you can do. So he comes to our house, he climbs up into the ceiling, comes back down, and he said, Kelly, all of the mold has dried up in your house, and it's all contained in a little tiny spot that's about the size of a small dessert plate. And he said, I I, I can fix your plumbing problems. I'll cut out the section with the mold, replace it. And all it cost us was $150 for supplies. Give God praise and glory. Now, it was a test. It was a test. And some of you are going through a test right now. And when things stink, when you just bought your first home and they tell you it's full of mold and you have a big ugly hole in your ceiling and you can't use your master bathroom, it's a test. And your flesh will wanna get fall down on the floor and kick and scream and throw a little tantrum and say, God, why did you let this happen? But if you're faithful, you're gonna say, nope, this doesn't make sense to me and I don't like it one bit but I can't have a testimony without a test, so I'm gonna trust in the Lord with all my heart. But listen, if we weren't tithers, we wouldn't have a leg to stand on. But because we were tithers, we could go to the word of God. You know, in Isaiah, God literally says, come and let us argue together your case. God wants you to come. He wants you to come to his throne. He wants you to bring your case to him and say, Lord, this is what you said in your word. Now I'm trusting you to bring it to pass not like a spoiled child, but like a faithful, obedient son or daughter of God who knows who he is. He's faithful and true. Now, let me tell you the end of that story. One year later, 18 years ago in November, Pastor Todd and I in faith came to Radiant Church and we were elected as the new pastors here. And so we sold our house 18 years ago and made $176,000 on it over what we paid. We got $176,000 more than what we paid for it. So why do I tell you that? Because it's such a good testimony of how God did what he said he would do. Rebuke the devourer, open the heavens, poured out a blessing. Hallelujah. Number seven is, oh, I'm sorry. Number six, tithing guards you from materialism. It guards us from materialism. And uh, 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 18, I don't have time to read it, but I encourage you to go read it yourself. And remember, I love Todd brought this out last night in the Saturday night service. He talked about the rich young ruler, that the rich young ruler rejected Jesus. And Jesus said how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And Todd said, you know, that rich young ruler didn't own a car. He didn't have a television. He didn't have an air conditioning unit. He didn't have a cell phone. He didn't have a computer. He didn't have a washer and a dryer or a dishwasher or a hundred other gadgets that you and I take for granted. And if he was considered rich, what are you and I considered? We are very rich, friends. You may want to sit around and let the devil have a pity, bring you into a pity party. But the reality is we are very blessed. We are very rich. And we need to always have a heart of generosity and gratitude unto God. And giving is the best way to break the back of materialism. And it leads us to a a contentment, a godly contentment. Amen? Number seven is God loves a cheerful giver. In 2 Corinthians 9, it says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. 
This is the word of God. You know, if, if you want generous blessings to come back to you, whatsoever you sow, Galatians says, that you will also reap. If you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. If you sow generously, you're going to reap generously. It says, each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And I'll tell you guys, I, I, I love to give, to give cheerfully, not because I have lots and lots of money. Like our air conditioning broke down this last summer and because we ended up having two unexpected surgeries, we depleted our savings. We didn't have the money to, replace, to repair our air conditioning. And sometimes we do without physical, material things in order to continue to give generously and liberally unto God, expecting Him to eventually bring forth the increase. Amen? So it breaks the back of materialism. Number eight is support of the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 19 says, go, Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. Now, not all of us are called to go physically to other nations, but we are all called to give, to tithe and give offerings to see that the gospel is preached to all nations. I love that our church is providing a water well for people in the poorest parts of the world in Africa, that we are now raising money. We have to raise $50,000. So that's another way you can give to see, to see the gospel preach to other nations because when they come to those water wells, they will also receive the living water, the truth and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And every time we give, every time we tithe into God's kingdom, we are giving to see the gospel preached and souls saved. Somebody asked one time, well, if I don't tithe, will I go to hell? Of course not, but somebody else may. What a thought, huh? Think if, if, if believers, if no one ever gave, if no one tithed, then there wouldn't, we would not have the resources to see the gospel preached to the uttermost parts of the earth. Your tithe, your giving is bringing people into heaven for all of eternity. And I just listened to Derek Prince, an old message by him recently, and he said, it's going to be so wonderful to go to heaven and of course see Jesus, but then to have the people that are in heaven because of our contributions, because of what, what we invested, to have them come and say, thank you for investing. I'm here because of what you gave. Number nine, it ensures that your needs will be met. Matthew 6, says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. So again, seek God first and seek his kingdom, put his kingdom first. And number 10, the last one, it helps meet the needs of God's people. In 1 Corinthians 16, and notice that most of the scriptures that we're referring to are New Testament. In 1 Corinthians 16, Paul said, now about the collection for God's people, do what I told the Galatian churches on the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income. What is that? That's percentile giving. That's the tithe. And he said, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. So we want to admonish you to follow the Lord, to obey him with all your heart, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and to love others as you love yourself. And when you do, you will be, as a biblically functioning Christian, a true follower of Jesus Christ who said, if anyone will be my disciple, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. You will be a biblically functioning Christian who's bringing honor and glory to God. And one day, you and I will hear those glorious words when he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Hallelujah. You give him praise today for his truth that sets us free, that keeps us free and sets others free. Okay. I'm going to pray. And then the ushers are coming to receive this morning's tithes and offerings. <laughs> And I did not do this out of manipulation. I was praying and just sensed it only makes sense 
that at the end of the service, we would respond to the word of God through our giving. So let's pray. Lord, we come to you again today, acknowledging that you are Lord and we are not. And Lord, we surrender our lives fully to you. We want to love you with all of our heart, soul, and mind. We want to love others as we love ourselves. We want to love like Jesus, give like Jesus, serve like Jesus. Oh God, we ask that you would do a miracle of generosity in each one of our hearts and that we, every one of us, would step out and step into a new level of faith in believing you and trusting in you to do what you said you would do. And Lord, I pray for every person here today that is a child of God, but they do not tithe. I pray, Lord, that you would stir our hearts and our souls to trust in you like, like sweet little Faithy, to trust in you, Lord, and, and say, Lord, it doesn't make sense to my natural mind, but it doesn't have to because you're Lord. And so, Lord, we want to honor you with the whole tithe. We want to honor you with generous, with, through our generous giving to see your kingdom advance both here and around the world. And we don't give reluctantly. We don't give out of compulsion. We give out of hearts that have been touched and transformed by the grace of God. So Lord, I pray that as each person steps out in faith, as your children, your sons and daughters step out in faith and in obedience to your word, as we do our part to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there will be food, plenty of food in your house. Rebuke the devourer for our sakes and throw open the windows of heaven. Pour out blessings upon us until they overflow us. I break, we break every curse, every financial curse from off of our lives through the principle of honoring God with our tithes. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now the ushers are coming. You can text your tithes and your offerings to the number 84321, or you can give their offering envelopes in the seat pocket in front of you. And I say again, Pastor Todd and I don't share this as a means of getting money from people. We share this in order to preach the whole counsel of the word of God. We have never in our Christian lives failed to tithe in little or in much, and we would never consider it because he's worthy. He's worthy, and we trust him with all of our heart. So I wanna challenge you to trust in the Lord and get ready for miracles. And those of you who have already seen miracles, let us know what God has done. I mean, how inspiring to hear the testimonies I'll tell you, I did not like walking through that 10-month test that we went through when we bought our first home, but I'm so thankful now because what a testimony to the goodness and the faithfulness of God. Now, as soon as the offering buckets are passed, if you'll go ahead and stand with me, we're gonna close out this service today. And the most important thing that all of us do is we've been talking about how God gives us a temple, our bodies, our lives, And he wants us to use our lives, our bodies, our hands, our feet. He wants us to invest our life into his kingdom, in a partnership with him. So our time, our talent, our temple, our treasure. But right now, the first step is to give your life to Jesus. And if you've never given your life to Jesus, friend, I tell you, I I don't have any hope to offer you apart from Jesus Christ. If you're here today and Jesus isn't your Lord, I'm gonna give you a prophecy from God and from the Holy Spirit. And that is that you have misery and trials, defeat, darkness, depression, disappointment ahead of you. Because you cannot live in this world apart from Jesus Christ and have any true freedom true true joy, true peace. Amen? And so today, He's waiting for you to say yes to Him, to say no to a life of rebellion against God and to say yes to Jesus, to say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you today. And He said, when you do that, He will make you new. 
I'll, I'll tell you, I, 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 for Christmas this year, I keep thinking about how He came for us to make us new. He didn't come for us just to walk alongside of us in misery and torment and torture and, and pain and shame and guilt. He came to make you new. He came to give you freedom. He came to give you a new life. He came to offer his body in your place on the cross so that you could be forgiven of all your sins. My goodness, Lord, that is more than enough reason for me to give you everything I have. But you have to receive him. So if you're here today and you know you're not right with Jesus, don't be ashamed of him. He was not ashamed to go to the cross for you. Just lift up your hand and say, I want Jesus today. I want that new life you talk about. Go ahead, keep those hands up in the balcony. Keep those hands up. There are prayer team members that are praying and are going to be there to pray for you. Keep those hands up. Keep those hands up. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you that you came for us to make us new. And those of you with your hands up, he came to make you new. He didn't come just to prop you up. He came to give you new birth. He came to give you new life. He came to set you free from the past. He came to wash away all of your sins. He says, I even even I am he who blots out your sins. Woo! Hallelujah! Oh, glory to God. Listen, when we understand that, that he came to blot out our sins, to make us new, to give us new life, new birth, to give us heaven, eternity, blessing, here and now and then. Why would we not trust him? We're gonna pray this prayer with those who are with us online who need to make this, this decision to follow Jesus today and with all of those who raise their hands. I want you to pray together with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I believe you love me. You sent your son to rescue me from my life of sin and shame and wretchedness. So today, Lord, I confess Jesus Christ is Lord. I turn from a life of sin and I turn to follow Jesus. Wash me, cleanse me, make me new and use me for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give him praise. Give him praise. Prayer team members, please come quickly to the front and bring those who raise their hands. Go ahead and, and walk to the front with them. If you raised your hand today in the balcony, come down. Listen, you need to come and let we say welcome to the family. Welcome to the family of God. Welcome to life. Welcome to peace. Welcome. Welcome. If you raise your hand, I am pleading with you, get down here. Get down here. Let someone pray with you. And we have materials that will help you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. If you pray that prayer online, let us know at decision at radiantchurch.org. You can let us know on a connection card. You can do that digitally or, or you can take a card out of the seat pocket in front of you. And if you need prayer for anything today, these prayer team ministers are here ready to pray with you and to believe God to do miracles. Listen, there's somebody here, you're, you're married and your marriage is in trouble. You, maybe you think that it's over, there's no hope. And God is saying, uh-uh, I'm the God of the miraculous. And what you think is impossible with man, God says it's possible with me. Get down here and let somebody pray with you because we have so many testimonies of people whose marriages, they felt like they were over and God healed them, restored them, and gave them the best marriage that you they could ever have dreamed possible. Listen, if you need prayer for anything, do not leave without receiving prayer today. God bless you.
Have a happy Thanksgiving and may Jesus Christ be at the Thanksgiving table together with you and your loved ones this Thanksgiving. And let's give him all the praise. Amen. Amen. God bless you.